Hello and welcome to the Happiness Is podcast with me, your host, Bruce Aitchison from Happiness Is Egg Shaped. And today we have an absolute hero, a man whose list of honours is longer than both my arms put together. And he is salt of the earth, an absolute gem from club land in the borders and been to the top, the very, very top, been to Everest, probably, and we'll talk a little bit about that. I'm not going to waste any time on the intro because we need to get in here and speak to today's very special guest, the one and the only Mr. Alan Tate. Hello, pleased to be on the show, Bruce. Been waiting Tate. a while to get on, actually. <laughs> 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 it's an absolute honour to have you, and obviously coming up for Lions season, when you look at South Africa, does that just bring back very, very happy memories? Uh, I mean, you know, it, you never forget that, obviously, it's the highlight of my life, and, um, you know, just thinking that they're going back there, and it's it's the time that's flew by, you know, 24 years, you just, you see it and you just can't believe it, you know, I was lucky enough to... We had a sort of reunion on, on this sort of podcast idea and uh, with Alliance about two weeks ago and just seeing the guys again was it was great to see them all, you know. You just you never forget their memories and just seeing the boys. We do we all look a bit older and heavier and whatever, but uh, no, it was good to just catch up with them again. When when we watch the Living with the Lions DVD, I don't know if you've watched it, I've watched it a hundred times, and you hear you have those speeches from Geech and, and Creamy. When you're sitting there in the room is that building you up or were you somebody that sat there thinking, come on, just get on with it? No, I, I was I was very much a sit at the back of the room kind of guy. You know, I wasn't, I, I liked to, when in team meetings, you always was a bit nervy that you might get asked questions. So I used to sit at the back and keep out of the way and uh, the head down. But no, look, you know, every individual gets something out of something. But Geech and Jim, you know, just to speak about them too, Jim was obviously when he took them guys away with Everest, you know, that chat was obviously for the forwards and he, he got them forwards really wound up, you know, all the time. And that was his sort of, that you know, he was brilliant at it. He was absolutely brilliant. Whereas the backs are a bit, you know, usually are a bit more um, laid back, as you could say. And uh, But Geech, Geech's speeches were always emotional, you know, and his chin was always going like, you, you knew how much it meant to him. And that I think that sort of, comes across to you that you know this guy is actually feeling every word he's saying and you know as if he was going to be out there playing so you you did get that off off both of them really you know Jim was, Jim was a real rever up where you know Geach really touched your emotional part and uh, I you know the two of them worked well together and you know as I say it, you know the, the, the two was, says it all really the, you know the success that we had. They, they were absolutely brilliant. I was actually speaking to Jim Telfer this week and I said to him I was going to be speaking to you and he was full of, pr full of praise for you, really uh, full of praise, uh, which getting praise for Jim Telfer is uh, is like gold, isn't it? <laughs> listen, I mean, I, I remember Jim when I first went away, he was quite a scary character. I remember you know, way back in the late 80s when I left rugby league and I thought, oh, I've crossed a lot of them guys, but... Jim was one of the first guys to open his arms when I came back, and the thing what I'd learnt in with the league sort of it's it's hard to put this you know, but, but they were like headmasters back in Scotland, the coaches. You know, you, you just when they spoke, everybody sort of listened and froze, and that's how that's the sort of attention that Jim demanded. But when I went away to league, and I had eight, uh, nine, ten years down there, you just learnt. Uh, they're just people, you know, they're just humans the same as us. They want the same sort of banter. They want the same. We had loads, you know, there was loads of banter in the changing room and off the field. And, you know, when the coach spoke, obviously you had to listen. But, and I, I, I think I, when I came back, I pulled Jim's leg a bit and, I, and he absolutely enjoyed it. I think he loved it. I think he thought, oh, this is great. You know, at last I've got people that are sort of having a bit of, because everybody just, I remember Stuart Grimes and some of these guys, they were petrified of him. You know, Tom Smith, you mentioned Tom. Tom and all these guys were petrified of Jim. Maybe because they were forwards, I don't know. But, you know, if he spoke, they, ooh, you know, the meetings went serious as that. Whereas, you know, I kind of was more relaxed and, and I pulled his leg a little bit on the training field and his assistants. And, and Gary Armstrong and Doddy joined in. And, and before you knew it, we had a great sort of rapport with Jim. I think he, I think he would be the first to admit he, he did get... A mellow a bit as he, you know, as, as his coaching career went on, and especially like the later years with Scotland in in the ninety nine, you know, that sort of when he come back and won the he was really he was great then, you know what I mean? He was we had some real fun times, and 
And Doddy and Gary drove him mad, to be honest. I mean, there's things they don't live just to wind him up. I remember he got a new, he got a new Volvo car off SIU. I you know, had all the singing and dancing buttons and everything. <laughs> Doddy and Gary got a lift with him. And, and uh, I don't know which one it was, but they turned on his heater seats and he didn't have a clue. <laughs> And he kept getting out of the car going, Mommy, back's burning, I'm on fire. He says, that them seats are red on. And it was these new heater seats that had been on. And Gary and Johnny had switched them on and he didn't know how to switch them off at all. He just, the things like that, it was honestly, it was non-stop. Jim was scared to go to bed at night because what they'd done in his room. And, oh, and honestly, it was, it was crackers. But I think Jim enjoyed that. And I think that Jim, if anything, I, you know, I, I'd like to have thought that, you know, when, with my relationship with Jim, we really sort of got on well and we, we as you know, as, as mates really, and 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 he he, so he, he did mellow definitely, and uh, and we had some good fun. You know what I mean? We had some real good fun. And but that's you joined them as a coach, didn't you? You joined them. Yeah, Jim took me on, which maybe maybe helped. You know, to later on, you know, Jim and uh, Jim and Geach asked me, you know, to to go on tour in two thousand and start as a defence coach for Scotland. So again, you know, it was great just to. You know, I down tools and put the boots down, and then lifted the coaching sort of uh, tracksuit and started coaching with the boys in two thousand out to New Zealand. Uh, tough to to start your coaching career as a defence coach, <laughs> but uh, but no, it was you know. But that I, I've got to thank them for that as well. You know that that's that's what you need as a you know as as a young coach. You need you need opportunities and uh, and uh, you know and um, and you, you you thank guys that that are, that are prepared to. You know, let you loose as a youngster. They don't know how it's going to go. You know, they're they're just putting the, you know, they're just banking that you'll you'll do okay. And uh, and I think that you know we didn't do too badly. No, very very well. And Jim, so your relationship with Jim, his bit about an honest player that looks himself in the mirror. He must have seen that in you. Now nobody has the success that you've had without being an honest player. You you can't cheat that. Where did that honesty and drive come from? It, I mean, look, I'm not taking any way from the, the Kelso boys when I first started. You know, they were great with me. You know, playing that Kelso team in the, back in the late 80s really bedded me as a player because, I mean, you know, like players like say, Andrew Kerr, you know, Baird D, Bob Hogarth and, you know, the forwards, Callender, Paxton, Jeffrey. Oh, you know, the list was endless. You know, that was a club team, by the way. You know, I almost named a Scotland team there. But they, they were great for me. But I really learnt my trade when I went to rugby league. That's where... Uh, you know, I seen the honesty in these guys that I was training with. You know, I went to witness who had just won the league title, which was the biggest trophy then to win. You know, I joined them a week after they'd won it, and uh, I thought to myself, "Oh, I'm going to meet superstars here and all this and all." You know, worrying and panicking and just you know, hopefully getting the respect. And so I went down there, and honestly, they were just tough lads that trained really. I know. People say rugby league's been professional. Rugby league hasn't been professional for that long. When I first went down, they, these guys weren't full-time rugby players. They were working nine to five, and then training four nights a week. Two in the gym, two were training, and then on a Saturday morning and playing on a Sunday. So that's how their life was. Yet the rugby union guys that signed for them uh, signed in the late eighties, like myself, Fire Davis, Moriarty, you know Devereaux, Hadley. You know, I could name it. The list goes on. We were all full time. We were getting paid just to play rugby, so we weren't doing anything through the week. We we could just wander about and do a bit of training on our side, you know. So I really learned this sort of the grit that these lads had and the determination that they had, and I just thought I'm going to have to work twice as hard to to get where they were. And you were coming off the back of playing for Scotland. Yeah. You've been to a World Cup in New Zealand, which must have just been well. I, I don't know what was that like going to the first ever World Cup. Oh, I mean, you know, just getting selected as, as an uncapped player was was a privilege, really. And you know, just to to get out in New Zealand, uh, the first World Cup, just a youngster. You know, as I say, I hadn't been capped at the time. I think it was me and Greg Oliver. I can't remember if there was anybody else that hadn't been capped. But um, you know, it, it was it was a great honour. You know, and, and and as I say, Scotland, the Scotland team was always we always toured. You know, I mean, there's something about the Scots. They don't mind where they go in the world. They'll, they'll always turn up and. And, and you know and and play to their best abilities and and it was no you know that that World Cup you know the the first game against France I mean it was a draw you know it could have went either way uh, which would have given you a far easier quarter final because obviously we ended up playing New Zealand in the quarter final which was you know tough and you know they they they, they were on to win the competition but um, France went across to Australia if I mind right and 
I, I think they played Fiji or somebody, so it could have been a lot different. But no, it was it was and getting my first cap, you know, I, for a player who I really really admired. I'd played alongside him for the South of Scotland again, a real, uh, you know. I, I always look at John Rutherford as probably the greatest player that could have been. He was he was a tremendous player, don't get me wrong. He, he was a brilliant player. But if he'd been a professional with his game and, and his knowledge and the way he played the game, his kicking, his running ability, his attack, you know, and he's, he was a biggish lad, you know, I, I think he'd have been one of the, the greatest ever, you know what I mean? He's, he's, um, and, and there'll be many there'll be many amateur guys that missed out, you know, Roy Laidlaw's his, his, his buddy. No, if they if they had a chance to be professional, you just you'd love to have seen it. You know what I mean? But hey, it never happened, and you know they're not going to cry over it now. But you know, it's, as I say, I was lucky enough to get my first cap at, at the expense of John Rutherford, who's it finished his career that injury. He was he retired after that competition, and uh, you know I, I kicked on, and I, I still meet John a few times. He's, he's still got the banter. He's still. You know, he still, he still knows his rugby, John. He's yeah, good, he does. He's, a good guy. he's, good he's guy. a great guy. And then you come back. So was that what got you in the knowledge and the vision of rugby league scouts having got your cap for Scotland or had those conversations already started? There'd been no conversations with, with the clubs, but what he did do was it proved what <laughs> my father's plan was unhatching before us. He spoke to me when I was 12, 13 year old, when I moved back to Scotland, when I was in work for 10 years of my life when he was playing league down there because he'd done the same, you know, for Kelso to, to Workington back in the 60s. And he said to me, I'm taking you home. Um, you'll play rugby union up there. And he says, someday you'll play for your country. And then, then he says, you, you're talking big books, as they used to say in them days. And and I, I you know, as a 13, 14 year old, I never took any of that in, but it was always a seed in my mind. And I always wanted to replicate him as a, if anything, I looked up to him the most out of anybody and I thought, I'm going to do what you've done and I'm going to beat you, like, sort of thing. So there was always that seed. So once I got my cap, I remember coming back and um, and him saying, yeah, you'd be worth a, you'd be worth a fortune now. You'd be able to go and play rugby for a living. And I'm like, oh, I've only just played for Scotland, sort of thing. He wasn't pushing me. He just said, you're worth a fortune. You know, he, he never he never swayed me to go rugby, uh, to rugby league, but he did, he did set that seed when I was a youngster. And what, then, as I say, I started, what, what, what was it took him there? Was it the just, chance to play rugby for for look, money? He had he had nothing, you know. What I mean, he was a he was a young apprentice joiner. You know, my mum was only eighteen; he was only nineteen, twenty. You know, two kids. Um, you know, he he, he 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 just wanted to better his life, probably. And uh, and he, you know, in them days, the the rugby league scouts were. We're up in the borders, um, and when, when he used to say, he, he said they used to watch the sevens a lot because that's what they were after in players. They, they didn't really watch fifteens because they weren't going to get anything, you know, familiar in, in the game. But they, they did come up in the in the springtime to the borders and watch all the sevens. That's where they used to pick out players, and you know, some of the greats, you know, like Sir Harry Witt, and you know, a good friend of my dad and Shilling Law, and you know. Valentine, there's been some great players from the borders went down to rugby league and, and done really, really well. So he, he was just lucky enough to catch the eye of a scout, you know, playing sevens probably somewhere. And uh, and they approached him to go down and, you know, to work in and play, to play rugby. And, and it was how... a bit massive, massive for him because obviously, you know, he, he wouldn't know what rugby league was. At least I had an idea. I played it when I was a kid. He'd never played the game or anything. It was it was, a, it was pr pr probably a daunting move for him. But with a young family and nothing much up here, he tried to you know better his life. I think he said he got six thousand for si signing on, which in nineteen sixty eight wouldn't have been too bad at all. Then. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, did did you and or your old man experience the the resentment that we hear about from union to league ah my dad was always bitter because the the kind of bad him out of the rugby club at kelso um so he was he was always he always held a little bit of a grudge against his old club which is which was unfortunate really. i mean he still had a lot of good friends there don't get me wrong but he would never go at the club he'd never come and watch me and and, and have a pint after the game or anything like that he'd never be down there doing that or anything he, he just he just stayed away, but I was I was the total opposite. You know, I signed straight after the winning the Melrose Sevens. I signed on the Tuesday after winning the Sevens on the Saturday, 
And um, and I was down to witness, you know, the following week in training. Um, so I, I, it was that quick for me. Uh, whereas, you know, Kelsey got in touch with me and said, when you're up, um, if you're up on this date, we want you to turn up and get your picture taken with the guys um, with a, within the league and, um, and, and the Melrose Sevens. So I, I turned up. I turned up one night. I was a bit nervy. I thought, oh, what are they going to say? But all the guys were sound. They were absolutely brilliant. And, you know, they all said, yeah. And I got the Kelsa kit on and got my photo taken. And, you know, I wasn't actually a Kelsa player, but I had the kit on again and got my picture taken in the, in the league photo and in the Melrose Sevens as well. So uh, it was totally different for me than what it was for my dad. You must have felt like you were on cloud nine. You won the league, you won Melrose Sevens, and you signed for witness. It must oh. you, life couldn't get any better than uh, that, could well, it? Well, exactly. And they, and they just won the league on the Sunday. You know, we we'd won it. we won Melrose. I'd, I'd spoken to witness the week before. They came up and said to me, you know, we're going to come up, and I was like, right. So you know, we're going to break the forms for you to sign. So I was I basically made my mind up. Um, and as I say, we won the Melrose Sevens. Witness won the league. And that's when I thought, oh, how am I going to get in this team sort of thing, you know. But uh, on the Tuesday, they drove up and I signed on the Tuesday. So it was all the, all, all the Wednesday. I think, oh, I better, well, I better get this right. Because <laughs> uh, we played Jed on the Tuesday, I think. And Jed beat us in the Border League playoff final. That's right. And I signed the day after. There was a lot of debate that I'd signed before that game. But I didn't. I didn't, honestly. I signed after that game. <laughs> Uh, Hon- honestly, Your Honour. Honestly, Your uh, Honour. It was. Uh, there was a big carry on about that, saying that Kelsey had played with me when I was a witness player, but I didn't. I signed the day after. <laughs> Uh, it's amazing. And how how did it work? I've watched documentaries. I've watched programs about Wales and this idea that the scouts in disguise with the collars up arrive at somebody's door in the dark of night to try and recruit them to rugby league. How did that? Because you wouldn't have had an agent. How did that happen? It's just word of mouth, really. Um, I think that, that it was my name at first got attention. Um, somebody phoned up my dad. They got hold of his number through a guy called Ike Southwood, who was a coach and a great, he was a legend of league back in the day, but uh, down in Workington. And obviously the board of news and look around mentioned my name and he'd phoned my dad up and said, is that your lad, this Alan Tate? And he said, yeah, it is. So then he, he just quickly got in touch with scouts because he was a scout in Cumbria. So he got in touch with Alec Murphy and a few others and Dougie Lawton down in uh, Widnes, they were coaching Widnes and St. Helens and said, look, there's a young kid here, might be interested um, so I, I believe the St Helens scouts came up and, and the Witness scouts came up uh, how they were dressed I don't know <laughs> but they did, they, did, they did watch the game um, and as I say the, the Witness came back and um, cut the first and I, and I signed for Witness rather than St Helens and that, that was a hell of a team that you joined and then you had oh. some Unbelievable uh, success! You must uh, have just thought, "This is it. I've made it." Oh uh, well, to, to be honest, I mean, look, I joined a league-winning club, and then they went straight into the Premiership as the top team. So they played, I think they played eight, was it? And then two plays. You know, it's that, it was a, it was the, it was the Premiership playoffs at the end, and um, I didn't think for the life of me I'd be involved. And I just went down, trained one night, uh, I trained for a week. Um, and the coach said, I'm putting you on the bench. And I'm like, hey. And think, think, thinking back now, as, as, as I, you know, at the time, you know, you know, nothing wants to get in your way. You just grab the opportunity. But thinking back now, me being a coach as well, uh, I, you know, I've, I've, been, I've been a coach yourself. You know, you know what it's like to drop somebody and, <laughs> and put somebody else in. They explain you have to do. But how do you explain? I've just signed this guy from Rugby Union. He's never played league. In his well, I'd been, it was ten year old, but I'd never played it, you know, at any standard. And he was willing to throw me into the quarter final of the Premiership. I could, you know, how did Dougie do that? What What was he thinking? And uh, and, and actually, he, you know, he only gave me a quarter of an hour of the game at the end. Um, and in that quarter an hour, I managed to get my face slapped twice. You know what I mean? So, and I mean, I was like, oh. How, you know, teeth are all slack and everything. And I thought, God, it's going to be tough, this. And, and the week after, we went straight to the semi-finals. And um, mm. the week after, he says, you're on the bench again. And I was on after seven minutes, because one uh, half time, because Martin Fire, he, he, got, he got a knock and he, he says, right, you're on the wing. And I, was, I went on at half time. So I got a half a game in the semi-final, which we won. 
And then in the final, he said, I'm putting you on the bench again. And I, I was on after seven minutes. The winger pulled his groin in seven minutes. I was on, so I almost played a full final. And we won again. So I, I lifted my first trophy three weeks into my rugby league <laughs> career. You know, running around Old Trafford with a trophy and everybody saying, you're brilliant. And I'm thinking, hey, what's going on here? But uh, that's how quick it happened in league for me. It was, it was crazy. It was absolutely... But full marks to Dougie Lawton. You know, I've got to take my off to Dougie that, you know, to do that to a team that had just won the league to leave one of them players out um, of a bench place. Because it was all about money. You know, and them day, you know, it wasn't all about money, of course. You know, you want to win the things, but there was a lot of money involved because that's when these guys earned their money was for winning. You know, they got 40 quid if they got beat and they got X amount if they won. And that X amount obviously went up as you went through the rounds. So, you know, I went to Wembley one year and it was 40 quid if you got beat or 80 quid, it was what the door were getting or it was it was 8,000 if you won. So <laughs> that, that's the comparisons you were on. Uh, and that's how the league boys worked. You know, that's why I took my hat off to them. It's, it's different now because contracts and agents have came in. But back in them days, it was you, you had to win to get your money. Um, and that's that's how it was. That's a pretty sizable incentive. Oh, I'm, tell, I'm telling you, that's why them league boys were desperate. And that's what that's how I got that winning mentality pretty early on. And that, that as you go back to that, you know, that you will have to, you have to work hard to get what you, you want off that that guy that's up against you. You know, that's where you get it from. Was that was that was that bedding in when I got down there that I seen how desperate these players were and you know, you get people, you know, coming out with speeches, the captain saying, These guys are trying to take the food off your kids' table and I'm like, Oh, well dearly me. <laughs> you know, it's pretty serious, is you know, but that's the kind of stuff the language they were using, like and I'm like, Oh God I so, you know, it, it just got embedded in you that it was about winning. And what what was it like after games then? Did that change what the clubhouse mentality was like? No, we still got uh, blitzed. Like you know? <laughs> <laughs> back in them days, it was we were uh, we were like caged caged animals. We had to stay in all week, and we always played on Sundays. So, and Sunday was closing time at ten o'clock, and nobody was out because it was a Sunday. And uh, apart for us lot that were just looking to get bladdered sort of thing you know what I mean <laughs> and then trained out on the Monday to get it out that was one thing I did learn as well was you know if you put it in you've got to get it out and uh, oh, was some of the sessions on Mondays were just oh you know you were just you were still half drunk like but you this, you didn't have to get it you know to get the sweat out of you sort of thing but no we still enjoyed a lot you know the boys we had a great great time together like you know because we were a lot of Kiwi boys and Australians and you know we had the Welsh guys and then obviously I was the Scottish guy and we had we had some great times at Witness. There were some side, honestly, I, I can't tell you how, how good a team they were, and how quick a team it was. It was the, probably the fastest team I've ever played in. That was forwards and backs. They were they were tremendous to play with. Like they were they were just like unbelievable, unbelievable it, athletes. It was it was amazing because it was on BBC. Everybody got to watch league. Yes, yes. So uh, the the league players were were household names. They were on Question of Sport, and everybody knew the league players because. Yeah. They were right there, whereas now yeah. it's on Sky. I feel like yeah. there's there's a lot of people are detached from the game. Yeah. Unless you absolutely love it, you're not engaging with it. Do you, do you miss that? Uh, well, it was the old grandstand music. I remember I remember some of the guys said to me when I come back to Scotland, you know, some of the younger lads that I was talking to, they used to say, oh, we used to watch you on grandstand on Saturday afternoons, you know, after in the clubhouse after their games and things like that. And that's what it was like. You know, it was prime time Saturday afternoon. You know, we played a lot on sat in cup games, especially you know semi-finals and and finals was always on a Saturday afternoon on the TV on the grandstand. So we were getting that, you know, massive viewing figures. And and, and as you say, a lot of rugby lads would probably see, especially like say what the, the witness team with Davis, myself, Fafire, Moriarty, Devereaux. You know, we had a lot of union players that, that were brought over into uh, into league. So it, there was a bit a bit of interest there. What, what was it players. like playing at Wembley? I mean that that must have oh. just been for a for a lad from working to ah. Kelso to be playing at Wembley and winning and being the best player on the park. That must have just felt. I mean, I've said it before. It must have felt like you were on cloud nine. Uh, well, I'll have to correct you on one of the points. I didn't win. <laughs> oh. <laughs> we, we, actually, we actually got beat twice by Wigan, which well, that was when I was at Leeds. So we, we were unfortunate at Witness. I mean. Um, we 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 were absolutely flying. We were, we were beating Wigan regular, but we always stumbled. I think I lost three semi-finals with Witness. I don't know what it was. 
Maybe we choked a little bit. I don't know because we were so desperate to get to Wembley and everybody wanted us there because of the speed that we had and that Wembley pitch and everybody says, you lot would rip it up. And Doug Lawton, Doug Lawton was the coach and he was the king of Wembley in the 70s We witnessed. I think he took them there about three or four times and lifted the trophy. He was the captain as well. So he was really, he built us up massively for that Wembley and he used to talk it up all the time and oh, we all wanted to get there. But unfortunately... Um, we didn't get there when I was there. We actually, they actually got there the year after I left. I went to Leeds and they beat us in the semi final. <laughs> so I was like, oh no. So Witness went when I, they beat us in the semi. And uh, as I say, they went and got beat by Wigan as well. And then I went the next two years um, and unfortunately got beat. But the experience to play there was just, you know, it was, it was fantastic. You know, it was the colours that got me, you know, walking out of the tunnel. You look at the far end. And and lucky enough, it was the it was the blue it was the blue of Leeds end, you know, and the Wigan were behind us. So as you walked out and looked behind the Wigan, the red and white was behind you. But it was the colour. Everybody just had red and white and or blue and yellow on it at the Leeds, and it was just it was spectacular. Like the sound, the, the weather was always great, in, in you know, end end middle of May it was always warm down there. So it was a great spectacle. Like, but unfortunately, I didn't. I think it's the only trophy I never lifted. But you know. As I say, I got there anyway and got to got to play there twice, so it wasn't too bad. And and when you went, when you play club rugby in Scotland, you pretty much want to play for Scotland. When you go and play rugby league, what was the ambition? It's funny, it's a good question that, Bruce, because people, there is Great Britain, and I, I went on two with Great Britain, I had 16 caps for Great Britain, and it was a good, it was a great honour. But the biggest honour in rugby league is your club. That is what you, you to win things with your club is bigger than playing for your country, and it's it, it's maybe a little bit unfortunate that's how it is, uh, but that's <laughs> that's how it was, and it, and it still is in rugby league. You know, winning trophies for your club is still the biggest achievement in uh, in rugby league. You know, that's that's what players want to do, uh, and of course now they, they kind of broke up the Great Britain as well. They've went their own ways. You know, Wales and Scotland and and Ireland have all got the rugby league teams now, and in, in England sort of. Well, it's obviously the main team because that's where all the players are. Um, so that they actually have England now instead of Great Britain. So, uh, and when you when you looked at Australia for rugby league, was that something that was tempting? Oh, it was definitely tempting. Um, I did actually sign. The, I mean, it's a long story, but when Super League first come over to um, to to Great Britain, there was a real. Super League and, and, and Kerry, it was all to do with Rupert Murdoch and Kerry Packer, all TV rights. So Sky TV wanted to, you know, wanted obviously to take over the UK. Kerry Packer, his Fox Net or something was out in Australia. They wanted to keep theirs. So they they started trying to sign all the best English players. So they were coming over in the draw, you know, coming over with, um, you know, just the agents and they were just trying to sign as many of the best players they could. So I actually signed, I sat in an office and signed for a club. Uh, to go to Australia and leave and leave Leeds, but um, as I say, things happened and Doug Lawton came back and said, "Look, I want you to stay," and so I ended up staying at Leeds. You know, it was a great club. I didn't really want to leave, but it was you know Australia was a, a place I really fancied going, and uh, eh, it's something I didn't do. But I, I went out there and played a, a sevens tournament and a, a couple of games out there, so it wasn't too bad. But you know, I, I would love to have experienced a, a you know a season with a club out there and when when you're down there and your mates from Kelso or the Scotland team were you getting phone calls saying what's it like is there a chance for me um the, I mean, as I say they, they were always on it, it was so it was such a big jump then you know the Welsh guys kind of flooded the market because they they done really well in in that in the, that 87 World Cup as well and then obviously getting Jonathan Davis over the line, you know, Widnes got him over the line and then when he came, it was just mental. Honestly, uh, Jiffy brought, <laughs> it, it just went crackers, you know what I mean? I mean, it was, it, you know, M Martin was a massive name and, you know, I had a little bit because obviously coming from Scotland, but not not to the Jonathan Davis sort of, he was the cue of the, of the whole thing and once he signed, it, it was just floodgates for Wales. It was the Welsh players that were coming up in droves like, you know, and um, they sort of flooded the market but, uh, Doug Lawton did like a couple of Scottish like he liked Gary Armstrong. He used to talk to me about Gary and as well. But it was such it, it was such a big jump then that it, you know you, once you give up 
rugby union, you couldn't go back in them days. That's that's what you were giving up. So if it hadn't worked out for me again, you did you didn't think of that because if you probably did, you wouldn't go. Yeah. Um. But you know, for me thinking back now, I actually threw everything away, everything, to do that stint with witness. And if it hadn't worked out, I was in trouble because I could never have played rugby union again. So, so I'd have been absolutely stuck. You know, I don't know what I'd have done. It would have been, it would have been a disaster. You know, injury or anything would have finished me really because I could never have played union again, and I wouldn't have stayed down there to play league. You know, so I'd, have, I'd have just come home, and you know, it would have been a long old time. You know, but luckily, as it, you know, things changed. Ten years later, rugby union went professional, and um, you know, it gave us an avenue back. And were were you watching union willing it to happen? Or were you just focused on what you were doing? I was just focused on what I was doing. We were really, you know, as I say, in them days, we played alongside the rugby union seasons. Now it's obviously different with them playing in the summer and winter. Um, but then we was right through the winter, just the same as union. So we were, I was busy at it all the time. Uh, I used to catch, you know, the Six Nations was always good to, to catch up on and watch when I was down there. You know, I'd always watch them games. Um, and I, as I say, so, you know, we were, we were pretty full on. And then... The game opens up. How how difficult was it to make the jump back? It wasn't really because I, I, it, it's funny. It, it absolutely again, whether it's luck or just you know whatever. Um, Dougie had been fired by Leeds, who was my big mate. He was the main reason I went to Leeds in the first place because he went from witness. Uh, he got fired. Uh, the new coach that came in, I didn't see eye to eye to him on a lot of the stuff that he was doing. Um, so. The things were starting to crack there, and I was thinking, oh, you know. So I, I was actually looking to go to other clubs in league at the time, and then obviously the Union went professional, and my ears just pricked up when I heard that, and I thought, oh, hey, this could be an avenue. And as I say, Rob Andrew, and there uh, was perfect. You know what I mean? It was Newcastle back up the road towards Scotland. Um, it was perfect. It just it just fitted everything like so. You know, Rob. Rob just um, I don't know how I got in I don't know how we all got in touch because there was no agents I didn't have an agent and so I, I don't know I think it was maybe because John Bentley had gone there maybe maybe John had said something about me being at Leeds and not not enjoying it I don't know but anyway Rob came looking and talking to me and you know I, I couldn't wait to get away like you know I was just ready for a new challenge so it was great how, to get away How did he sell Newcastle to you because obviously that's not really a uh... They didn't have anything to go on. So how did he sell Newcastle yeah. to you? I think it was just the location and, and me getting back towards, you know, back home. You know, I was able to move back to Kelso and travel down with Gary. You know, I travelled every every other day with Gary um, Armstrong. So, you know, it was just that case of getting back home, really, I think, was, was the main driver. Um, so it didn't matter what Rob said, I was coming. <laughs> I was going to go. Uh, but as I say, you know... Look, Twigger Marlin and all these guys, you know, it was it was some club, you know. I, I, obviously, Pat Lamb, I didn't know much about Pat Lamb until I got there, but you know, there were some players like, you know, there was it was it was great to be again alongside great players was was fantastic. was fantastic. And what was it like having Doddy and Gary with you, George Graham, you know, Scottish uh, guys? Was that important? Oh, definitely. Uh, as I say, I travelled a lot, you know, a lot with Gary and become great great friends with Gary and Doddy. Doddy had just moved down there and, uh, you know, it was great to have them Scottish lads there and, and, and a bit of banter. They were obviously younger than me, so I was I was before them a little bit, in you know, in the borders stuff. But, uh, I, I mean, again, two great characters. I mean, oh, gee, to me, the, the stuff that, you know, that, that carried on. As I was talking about Jim driven mad, they had the whole coach driven mad in Newcastle, you know. Coming home on the bus from Newcastle, we had some long journeys and... Uh, you know, there was a few beers scooped on the way home and uh, and Gary and Doddy, anybody fall asleep, honestly, they used to untie your laces and tie your laces. If you were on a ta you know, on a seat next to the table, they'd, they'd tie it. Well, they'd, I'll tell you a story because they'd done it to me. So I was sat and we'd had a few beers and I fell asleep and I got the biggest slap in the face I've ever had, you know. And Gary was stood there. <laughs> and I'd, your first reaction when you wake up is just you, you just fly at somebody like with a slap in the face as well. I just flew at him. And honestly, I just went eh, flying onto the floor. I thought, what's happened there? And Gary's running down the bus laughing. Johnny's laughing the head off. They're all laughing. And I had my shoelaces tied around the pole of the table. 
<laughs> and honestly, I just went crashing to the floor and I just said, they've done, they've done me again. But they've done it to everybody. They just, you just didn't fall asleep on that bloody coach or, or anywhere around the changing rooms. They, just, they, were never, they never stopped like just unreal. daft wee lads. What was it oh. like having the, the wee lad at number 10? He he turned into a decent player. Wilkinson? Yeah. Uh, so well, I, I wonder I, what but, happened to him. Ah, uh, exactly. <laughs> uh, what happened to that kid? But I, I think Johnny as well will be the first to say, just like me, you know, going back to my Kelso days, when I mentioned six international rugby players in, the t in a club team, Johnny was the same. You know, Johnny was a great prospect, but... His start in his life, we joining that Newcastle team. You know, I, I was lucky. I played a, a, you know, a little bit with a season with him, and then a, a, a season and a half just really. He was just starting to come into the team as, as I was leaving. Um, but I mean, we, tra you know, he was out training and kicking balls, and he, he was, you know, he, he could see his dedication was get, was massive. Like, you know, he he was a real good kid, but he still had to learn the ropes and he still had to go through it all. But you know. He had some great players round about him all over, you know, big Inger outside him sitting on his shoulder, you know, for the start of his sort of, you know, to come in as a 10 and have a 12 of Ingers or a winger just to sit on your shoulder to, to give you an option out to, if it's a bad ball or whatever, um, was a great upbringing for him. And I think he'd be the first to admit it. But yeah, he was, a, he was a great, dedicated kid. You can't take anything away from him, what he, what he, you know, what he achieved. But again, you need great players around you. To, to, you know, I looked at it. The best thing about Johnny... When I looked at the end of his career, what he gave back and, and then how, how he drove that Toulon team, you know, he was driving it like from where he was come from. You know, Rob Andrew was the driver and Dean Ryan were the drivers, at, you know, at, at the Newcastle. And then to see Johnny at the end at Toulon, um, just driving that team on, you know, with some great players around about him, you know, again, but he was he was the main driver of that team. And, you know, he, he look what they, they went on to do, like, you know, so... No, and you've, was... you've left you've left club rugby in Scotland to go and be a professional in rugby league, and then you come back to a professional team who are still playing in black and white, which is quite a nice wee yeah, a, yeah. A nice wee yeah. Uh, How how was the game in the time you'd been away? Oh, massive massive improvement. Um, I mean, I left. I left not long after um, the England. We played England at Twickenham, and. Uh, as I say, it was a killer. I think it was nine six or something, like that. twelve nine or something like that. It was, it was Rob Andrew was at the fore of it all, you know, just kicking over, chipping over the penalties, and it was the worst game of rugby I think I've ever played in my life. <laughs> and I, and that was international rugby. That was it. So I was like, oh, but you know, compared to when we came back, it was definitely a lot, lot better. Um, obviously, they were starting to talk about defences and and things like that, you know, and so and. It, as I say, the players were getting fitter, a lot fitter, you know, training a lot harder. So ev evidence improved um, when I came back, you know what I mean? It was it was a far better game, far better game than when I left. And was the 97 Lions on the horizon? Was it something you'd even thought about? <sighs> not, in, not in my wildest dreams. I mean, you know, it, playing for Scotland again was, I'll, I'll be honest, I, you know, I did think, oh, would I would, would I have a chance of getting back involved, you know, because... I saw again, you know, you're going about whirlwinds. Yeah, my, my career just seemed to happen so quickly. And I, I came back, you know, to play for a Newcastle. They were in the second division or Division One. You know, they weren't in the Premiership. They were in Division One. We were playing Nottingham and Coventry and all these teams all around the place. But we still, you know, we were smashing them like. But you were still playing a poor a standard of rugby. But you know, to be asked to come and train with Scotland in the January, I think I joined them in the in the October. And then I was asked to join, come and train with Scotland in the, in the January, so or the February. I can't remember. And it, you know that's only three or four months back in the game. So it was just another whirlwind. And then after that, you know, to get the nod off Geach to go on the Lions, you know, three months after that was six months after coming back was it was just crazy, it was just absolutely crazy. You know, it just it was as I say again that whirlwind again. It's just. Um, and quite a lot's made of the league influence on that '97 Lions team. Did did you were you aware of that at the time, or were you just being Alan Tate? I was just being myself, but I knew once we got there, um, we could add a lot in terms of our just a, a little bit of preparation and and the mental side of it, and but main, mainly the communication on on the defensive side of things that that we really cranked it up, um, and the boys had never sort of. 
I don't think they'd, they'd heard guys shouting, you know, I've got him, I've got him, you know, sort of pointing at players and marking players and, and really, you know, and that's that's what, like, Gibbs and all these guys, Bateman, you know, they all, John Bentley, they all brought that into the, certainly in, in their sort of wider channels outside, you know, uh, numbering off in defence, you know, letting people know you, who you've got and talking to the guy next to you, shouting opposition's name, you know, he's going to come round the corner, you know, we had it all sort of, we added that into what Geech had already sort of put in place and, uh, and as I say, I, we definitely had an influence, there's no doubt about it. Was that a plan from Geech and, and Creamy that, right, we, we're going to utilise these boys or was that just an added bonus of what you brought? <laughs> Look, they, they, they would answer that, you know, but but I would have thought there'd be something in that, you know, with the amount they took, they're taking, um, I think there would be there'd have been something in there. Um, so no, but because Geech, as, as I said, Geech is a thinker, is a, is a real thinker coach and he would be thinking about that tour, you know, months and months, and then he'd be thinking about combinations of players and who to play where and how to get, you know, how to do this. So, you know, he he would have had time to to work all that out, and I'm pretty sure he'll have sat down and thought these league boys. I could I could put a fair old, you know, defensive wall organisational wise and and up in front of the spring box, and uh, and that's what happened. And the the selection for. The test team. I mean, Neil Jenkins at fifteen. There's no way anybody would have picked that beforehand. You know, at the moment we're all trying to pick our, our starting test team for what's coming, trying to guess what they're going to pick. There's not anybody on the planet had Neil Jenkins starting no. at fifteen in the test team. No, no. It's uh, again, Gage. You know, thinking, thinking all the time. Um, obviously, goal kicking second to none you know he's right up there with the best of the best get jenks you know for me he was the greatest ever goal kicker like i just couldn't believe how good he was and um so no jenks was there he obviously got him in the team for that reason um but he, he again jenks was you know he's one of these deceptive lads you, you once you got to run alongside him and train alongside he, he had good well obviously he had good hands because he was a 10 but he, he had good pace as well you know and he, he was he was a brave enough character so um you know, getting getting him to ten, uh, playing at fifteen, and, and you know, and managing to convince. It's a bit like what I did. You know, if somebody said to me my favourite position was thirteen, but I wasn't going to complain about being stuck on the wing. You know, what I mean, I, I wasn't. That, that I was just happy to be in the team. So I think Jenks. You know, when you looks, Jenks looked at the front line and seen Gregor at ten, and him stood back in the in the back line. He would have been thinking, "Why am I not in the front there?" But I think we were just all just, you know. It was just getting an honour to get picked in the team. That was, you know, it was such a strong squad and such a good squad. I think if anybody had complained about where they'd been, you know, playing, I think they'd have been sent home on the next flight. <laughs> uh, I was, I was going to ask you about playing on the wing, and I saw you recently giving a a big shout out to Tim Rodber for throwing you that pass. <laughs> I well, as I say, you, you forget things, you see, and and you know we're going about the game as it is now, and um, I actually spoke to Gregor. Um, four, six, eight months ago, maybe longer, and he was, you know, we we're just on about a little couple of things because you know Greg is doing well as a coach. And I just said, look, the rugby league philosophy when I went down to league, and it still is, it was a race to the corner. It's to get the winger into the corner. So that's why in, in league the wingers score forty tries a season. You know, if I had scored sixty one year, the second year I was down at Witness, and I must have fed him thirty times. But <laughs> that was that was our beliefs: is you score in the corner. So. You never see a defender stood on holding the goal flag, you know, the touch, you know, the touchline goal flag. So you never, you don't get defenders out there. So if you can, your know, skill wise, get it there by boot or by passing, you should score if you can get if you can win the race to the corner. And then obviously that, you know, it breaks down when you start coming through the middle of them and all the rest of it. You take the shortcut as we used to call it and, and score through the middle. But it, you never see in the in, in the modern game now. I mean. The Champions League game on Saturday, I was bored stiff. I was like, "What? What is this? What is it like?" You know, it's just like, and 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 I get worried with rugby union at this current stage where it is in in terms of where is it going to go because we we tend to follow the leaders, and France have won all them Europe. You know, they won both cups. They had two teams in the final of the big one, and I'm thinking, I hope we don't start copying what they're trying to do because. Just running into people all the time doesn't. I just can't see. You know, I just, I just, 
I just think we've got to get better than that. We've got to get the game playing somehow. So, as I say, and Tim Rodber throwing that pass, I'd forgotten he'd even threw it, to be honest. You know, you, you see it and you think, God, I, I can't even remember him throwing it. Yeah. I thought it was. I thought it was Gregor I, or something. I have, to, I have to admit, when I saw you do that on Twitter, I didn't realise it was Tim Rodber either. No. And then I wanted to ask you this question: Would Tim Rodber have thrown that pass at Twickenham playing for England? No, no, nowadays. No, In, then would he have or, thrown or that then, pass? No. Well, no. I'd probably say no, which is a bit with England, but. He was being coached by Geach. That's so, that's that's what I wondered because when uh, I saw not, it, I thought he would have just smashed into somebody. Yeah, yeah. One of the biggest things Geach ever said, and, and as a coach, as you know, Bruce, you, you you go on all these coaching courses and all, and you travel the world and you and you, you get great, but you'll only pick one or two ideas up of every one in your own mind, and you'll pick that up. And and Geach always said, "Slow ball is ball off the floor," and I used to think. All right, and then you get into coaching and you think about that, and it is you know, a ball. If a, if a nine has to pick the ball off the floor, it's slower than it getting popped up to him or popping the ball up at the next, you know, forwards popping it between each other. And I always think that that you know, it's the coaching that's that that stops the game. I mean, for instance, I know I'm going on to rugby sort of technical things now. I watched I'll that Champions, I watched that Champions League game, and honest to god, I was like, this is dreadful. Um, there was one piece of class in it where it where Dupont put a cross field kick in to the winger. Um but apart from that, I mean but that that's every week in rugby league. You go go down to any game of rugby league will do that all the time. And and and, and so can so you know Finn Finn can do it well as you know gone about Scotland. So it isn't a great it, it is a good skill but it, you know let's see more of it. Let's let's play along with it. But you know going back to that the, the point I then I then went onto the TV and I, I picked up the Let's see how the Aussies got on against the, you know, in the Super Rugby. And the Crusaders smashed the Reds by an embarrassing score, but it's 62 24 or something. I thought, oh, yeah. I'll have a look at this and see what's going on. Is it the defences or is it the attack that's good? And you've got to give your praise to the New Zealanders. They're already in front of us and they're manipulating. I'll tell you what, New Zealand, and Jim, Jim will be the first, Jim Telford will be the first person. We're always following New Zealand. And New Zealand are already manipulating defenders. Because they know that the high tackle's gone out the game, so they're now doing. They're now playing the game because they know low tackling is going to be what everybody has to do. So they're, they're now running patterns and freeing their hands up, and they're running the forwards in little shapes so that they can get their hands through the contact and then offload through the con. It's not even offload; it's a pass, just a straightforward pass behind a defensive line. And it it was tremendous to watch. You know, I'm thinking these Crusaders, you know. Uh, you know, and and we should be singing their praises, not the way that you know Toulon battered themselves. You know, battered them way till a victory. That's that's my opinion. I know I'm a back, and I know forwards will say, "Oh no," but you know, you, you've got to have your grunt as well. I, I fully admit that you've got to have your grunt. There's no problem. I don't mind running hard lines and getting forwards running good lines. But if you if you run into people with your head pointing towards the ground, I'll guarantee you, you go into ground. <laughs> and right, so you. so here goes then. Alan Tate's coaching the Lions. What? Well, two things. One, what do you think they're going to play like? And two, how do you think they could play? I think they'll go. I think by the way they've selected, they're going to go a, a, probably a direct Gatlin route. They're going to take them on uh, physically, and yet you know again you have to do that. But I think. Underneath it all, for me, they've got to come up with something different. And I hope Gregor, you know, can persuade them to get an offloading game going, a quick rook game, um, and try and break the game up. You know, more ball off the top of lineouts. You know, get moving it. I think that, you know, where you're launching in nowadays is, you know, if you start driving walls against them, you're going to get into their kind of game. So uh, I did notice a lot of that in the Six Nations, which is refreshing to see. Was a lot of balls going off the top now and. Even if they have a stab in the middle, it's better than, you know, setting them all up and then trying to launch off them all. It's just, you know, so I think they're going to have to have an offload. Not, it's not an offloading game. It's just, it's more of a a quicker, you know, let's let's play a little bit quicker and let's try and tire them out. Um, and that's how Geach's philosophy was. Geach always said, when, we're, when, they're, when they're walking, we'll be running. Just remember that, lads. When they're walking, we'll be running. And and a lot of the games, the last twenty minutes on that ninety-seven tour, we did 
you know, cause them a lot of trouble. I don't think you're going to break the spring box down with any type of game in the first 40. But if you can keep in there 60 minutes and then still be on your toes and running, I think we might have a chance of, you know, breaking them up. When when you were on that ninety seven tour, I think both Geach and, and Creamy both said a lion in South Africa is is special. And you you got to be that special lion in South Africa. If you were asked to present the jerseys or to make a speech to the, the boys before they get on the flight and go down there, what, what would you say to them? Oh dearie me. Um it look I think yeah. I think one thing. I think the chin chin would be going because I can I can get a little bit emotional myself when I when I talk about things like that. So uh, I think it would soon be going because it brings back memories. It's it's more it's and that's what I would say to them. It's the memories that you get out of it, out especially winning. Um, you don't really remember anything bad about that tour. You know I can't really remember anything bad about it, but I remember everything that's good and the memories that I got out of it and just the the pride that it brought to. You know, my family, you know, my friends, you know, just people of Kelso. So Geach, Geach says... Got quite yeah, emotional. I know, and, and I can understand that. And that, the hairs in the back of my neck have gone up. Geach says on that tour that in 30 years' time, you'll meet each other and there'll just be a look. Is that... You said you were on a Zoom call with it with some of the guys yeah. recently. Is that is that a true thing? Do you look at them and there's just a look? There's you don't need to say anything. There's just a we did something pretty special together. Oh, I mean, God, I mean definitely. I mean, I, I think I actually said that on the podcast when when uh, Geach was there. If there's anything out of, of all them speeches, that's the one that. As I say, you pick something off a coach and as you go along and you write it down, but that's the one where I got off Geach. So it's absolutely true. It's funny, you're, you're walking, you can be in a club room, you can be anywhere and you'll bump into somebody and it's the first thing that you, you know, I met Martin Johnson one day and it's the first thing I thought because he was a great captain, he was an absolutely brilliant captain. It's the first thing I want to shook his hand, you know, to say, hi, hi Martin. It was the first thing I thought of was that, you know, you were my leader, you were my captain in, in South Africa. And, and that's the kind of, it does, it, it, it's, it's that, that speech is so, so true. I don't know where, you know, if Geach got that himself or whether he got it off a Lions tour back in the 70s, I don't know. But it, it was a, it's a hell of a phrase and, uh, and it doesn't, it does, it sticks. It sticks definitely. Yeah, I, I absolutely love it. So on that tour, I, I hate to say this because you've just said you only remember the good things, but you've actually got something coming up for your big mate Doddy, and Doddy obviously went on the 97 Lions oh, tour, and because of that clown and Mpumalanga, um, yeah. it, Dod, Doddy's tour finished there, but you've got, a, you've got a challenge coming up for the big man. Yeah, he's. Uh, I mean, I've all, he, he, obviously he, there's been a lot done with MND, and you know, and, and Doddy's been fantastic, and obviously Rob Burrows as well. You know, down at Leeds, uh, I met Rob a few times when I was down there, and a great little player. And you know, it, it's it's so so sad. You know, I mean, it's, it is, and I've always wanted to get involved with something, but they've either been further away or I've been doing something. But um, it was actually Kenny Logan. I mean, Kenny and Gabby have been really good as well. You know, on on this on, on the cause and. Uh, Kenny phoned me. Um, I wonder. I knew he'd be wanting something because he, he, he's, he's never phoned ever. I've, I've had the first time. I was totally maybe ten years. So when I seen his name, I thought, come up. I thought, oh, what's he after? But, I mean, what, you know, it's a, it's an absolute. It's a great cause, and and you know, and I'm gonna. I'm, I asked him what we were doing. Um, it's still a bit sketchy, mind you. It changes it all the time. There's more and more people seem to be getting involved, and there's more of this and there's more of that. And I'm saying, Kenny. You know, don't go too far. I'm not cack out. <laughs> so I think we're up 31 mile at the minute. So I believe, uh, which is far enough. Um, so you know, it's it, it's the walk in to, from um, from the borders in, into Edinburgh. Um, as I say, for Doddy's cause and, and MND, and I've got a page up. The daughter set it all up. I haven't got a clue what I was doing. So the daughter set it all up, and I've sent it to all my friends and. You know, fair play to them. You know, they've they've all donated something. You know, I don't care if I was better than Nout. So, um, just you know, hopefully they can keep on donating. And I, can, I think there's a target that Kenny's set me 
Um, so. Yeah, he set your target. I think it's sixteen hundred pounds. Uh, well, you're you're going to walk from Doddy's farm in the borders to Murrayfield the day before Scotland Japan, is it? Uh it's something like that. It's something like yeah. that. It, as I say, it is changing all the time. <laughs> from what I, gather. So, I don't know. I uh, try to get uh, you know. It, it's typical Kenny. Like he's he's trying to get it bigger and bigger. So. I will probably be stopping all the traffic next and things like that. So, well, I, but no, as I say, it's it's a great cause and and Doddy's a, he was a great guy. Doddy, he's, he's, he's sound as a pound, big Dodd, and uh, you know he's, I've got some great memories of him as well. You know we've we've had some good times. Yeah, it's uh he's some man and it's a brilliant cause and I'm sure or I hope anyway that this is going to get you a few more donations. Hey, okay. listen, I have absolutely loved this and an hour has just completely flown by. Uh thank you. I I think I've said this to a couple of people. I think I'm going to have to get you back for a part two because there's still <laughs> a whole load of stuff on my list that I've not got to. Um, but the only bit of this that's scripted is I get the guest to finish the sentence. So this I've, I have prompted you with this one, so it'll be interesting to see what you come up with. So Alan Tate, finish the sentence for me. For you, happiness is? My dogs, quad bike and the Cheviot Hills. <laughs> That sounds like a wee piece of heaven, Tate. Oh, it isn't for them. They've got to run after me. <laughs> On the Alan, bike. Alan yeah. Tate, British Lion, Scotland Kelso, Witness Lead. It's just amazing. Thank you so, so much. Uh, we'll come back and we'll do a special on the 1999 Five Nations. We never even got onto that one. Uh, exactly, exactly. And that was a good one. As I say, memories of... A plenty there, and uh, I definitely I will. It's it's good. If people are willing to listen, I'm willing to talk. Well, I'm I'm willing to listen. I don't care about <laughs> people. I'm willing to listen. <laughs> Tay, thank you very much. No a, brilliant, a brilliant honour, and I'm looking forward to catching up with you. And hopefully, I'll see you on that walk. Yes. Cheers, Bruce. All the best. I will you see man. you on that walk. Cheers, bro. Thank you, sir. Trama, trama. Uh, one of the most enjoyable hours you could possibly spend in the company of an absolute legend. How good is he? And still lots to talk about. And what did he do? He nailed it. What's it all about? It's making the memories. It's building relationships, sharing experiences and making memories. And you heard it from the one and the only Mr. Alan Tate. Thank you very much for listening. I hope you've enjoyed it as much as I have. Please catch us on Apple, on Spotify and on Acast for the pod. And we'll see you on YouTube and Facebook for the video. Please leave comments if you've enjoyed it. If you can, leave us a review, subscribe and tell your friends. And hopefully I'll be back again very, very soon with another special guest. My name is Bruce Aitchison and my happiness is egg-shaped. <laughs>